Hi everyone and welcome to today's video where we're going to be doing a guide for Manchu starting as John Zhu for EU4 1.31 Leviathan. If you enjoyed this video consider leaving a like, it really helps out the channel a lot and if you really like it you can always subscribe, let's try and hit 40k subs huh? And you can become a member today. So like I said we're doing a guide for Manchu and we're going to be starting as the nation of John Zhu right here. I think the most powerful candidate and the most popular one for sure for forming Manchu and later Qing. We do start off as a tributary of Ming which is excellent. We do want to be a tributary until we're ready to fight them and we're pretty much the most powerful horde in this region. In 1444 we even have a level 3 fort something our main rivals don't have at this point. So. Let's take a look at what we need to do as John Zhu in order to form Manchu. Of course, this is the decision right here, adopt Manchu identity, and we need to own the core province of Jilin right here, along with 20 other cores that are Jurchen or Manchu culture. Of course, the Manchu culture doesn't exist yet, so we need it to be Jurchen, and we're going to be fighting these guys over here first. So for the time being, we're going to set our free merchant to collect in Beijing. We're going to swap them around later, and we are going to take the yellow shamanism decision, which gives us plus two tolerance of Hedons for the rest of the game. And we're gonna introduce the vision quest as well. Then we're gonna add some rivals. I recommend rivaling Hai Shi, of course, and pretty much your two other neighbors, Udegi and Dongai. There we go. Now we're gonna go into our estates and summon the diet. You're gonna pick the only agenda that's available to you. Then we're gonna give the tribes larger tribal hosts. We're gonna recruit four banners, and then we're also gonna give them primacy of the bannermen. Then we're gonna sell titles and seize land. Banners are special units that some of these Jurchen nations can get and they have plus 5% discipline compared to regular units. They use only a quarter of the regular manpower. They do reinforce 50% slower though, but they are 50% cheaper to maintain. So that's why when you spawn them, they start off as 100 and we need to wait for them to basically reinforce all the way. Of course, that doesn't use manpower. Next, we're gonna give our ruler here military command, get these guys together and get ready for our first war. We're not gonna be hiring any advisors because, well, we are pretty poor at the start. Of course, we are also gonna royal Mary Ming and once that diplomat is back we are also gonna improve relations with them at all times. Now it's time to wait for December 12th and there we go it's December 15th in my case I am gonna start improving relations with Ming and it is time to declare our first war which is of course gonna be versus Hai Shi. Now they could have one or two allies at this point and in my case they have allied Dongai actually. We are gonna be declaring on Hai Shi, Tribal Feud, for Jilin and check to co-belligerent any of their allies. In my case I can co-belligerent Dongai and we're just gonna be declaring. First, I'll focus on knocking out Dongai, and then I'll set my sights on a high sheet. At this point, you can hire another general if you want to, I will do that. Now that I've beaten up Dongai, and once you've done the same, or maybe you're fighting some other nation like Udegi, of course you won't be able to fill annex someone like Yiren or Solon if they've managed to ally high Shi, we will be separate piecing them. This is because if I piece them out in the main piece deal, I'm not gonna be able to full annex them. As we can see, I can only take two provinces from them. So that's why I'm gonna be separate piecing Dongai, and taking all their money. Like I said, you will do this as well if you're fighting Udegi or Dongai, nations that you border pretty much. Of course, once we take their provinces, we are going to be raising them to make them cheaper to core and so we can get some ducats and monarch points as well. You should be raising every province. At this point, you might want to start improving relations with outraged countries. Even if a coalition forms, these nations are very weak, but it's better to prevent a coalition from forming. And there we go, now I've fully occupied Hai Shi, and of course we will be full annexing them as well. And I took all their money too. I will be burning the provinces once again. Don't forget to do that. And there we go, now I'll be coring them up. One part of the adopt Manchu identity decision is pretty much done. We just need to finish coring Jilin. And now we need to own 20 core provinces with Jurchen culture. If you fought both of these nations like me, and it is pretty likely that you'll be fighting Hai Shi and Dongai, they ally each other pretty often, you will probably look like me once about two or three years have passed. And now we have 19 provinces with Jurchen culture, which means next up on our chopping block has to be the nation of Udegi right here. They're the only other nation with a Jurchen culture apart from us, Hai Shi and Dongai, so we have to fight them. And in my case, they've allied Korchen. 
it's fine. They can ally either of these nations. The only problem you could face after you fought Haishi and Dongai is if some of these guys over here have allied the nation of Oirat. Luckily in my case they haven't, but if it does happen in your situation, you're just gonna have to skip them unfortunately. Most likely they won't ally Udegi. Korchin is probably the nation that they would ally. At this point your army should look a little something like this, even though it is pretty expensive and we're still losing quite a bit of money. We'll fix that pretty soon though. So now it's time for our second war, like I said, versus the nation of Udegi 99% of the time. If you can't fight them for some reason, sure you could fight Yeren or Nivik or Korchin or someone like that, but we need that 20th Jurchen province because then we're gonna get cores on the entire Manchuria region. Pretty much free cores on Yeren, Nivik and Solon. So I am gonna be declaring on Udegi using the tribal feud CB of course, I'm gonna declare for this province right here and it does seem like in my case they have allied Oirat. But I am gonna get around that by simply declaring on Korchin, not co-belligerenting Udegi, taking one province from them so I can complete that decision and gain cores on the rest of them and I'll also make Udegi end their alliance with Oirat. So that is how I would get around something like that by declaring on their ally and making them break their alliance with Oirat. And this is of course in relation to whichever nation has allied them. So I'm just gonna declare for Poduna right here and there we go. I'm actually gonna focus on Udegi first. And there we go, I full siege Udegi and I will make them end their alliance with Oirat, so that's an easier war later. And I'll take just one province, just enough to complete this decision right here since I have 19 provinces right now. And there we go, that's done with them. Now I just need to focus on taking out Korchin. Of course, Korchin is not in the region of Manchuria. We won't be getting cores on them, so we can just annex as much as we want without worrying about getting their provinces cheaper for later, like we are gonna get them for these nations up here. And there we go, I've beaten up Korchin as well, and I will be taking as much as I can from them, actually almost full annexing them. In fact, I'm not gonna be full annexing them, and instead of that, I'll leave them with three provinces but take all their money. And there we go, now I just need to wait for some of these provinces over here to finish scoring, basically these three, and I'll be able to form Manchu. You should have everything you need to form Manchu after one to three wars, depending on who Hai Shi was allied to of course. If you have Oirat as an available rival, try not to rival them we could possibly use them later in our war versus Ming. And there we go, now that we've cored up 20 provinces with Jurchen culture, we can take the decision to form Manchu. Like I said, it would take you one to three wars, and don't worry if you're not doing it in 1449, play at your own pace. And there we go, now our Manchu. Of course, we are gonna take new traditions and ambitions, and now we gain cores on these provinces up here, which are owned by Solon, Yeren, Nivik, and the rest of the ones from Udegi. And now it's time to focus on, well, cleaning these guys up. The fun thing about this is that we also gain cores on provinces that Ming owns. Now, the good thing about this is, because Ming is our overlord, they will periodically get events where they can give these cores back to us, and 99% of the time, they actually do choose to give us back some of these cores, which is pretty nice. There is a fort province right here, and by them giving these provinces to us for free, we don't have to take them later. I will show you guys how that looks like once I get an event for it, and you will be getting those events for sure. Now that a few months have passed, I will be declaring my next war against the weakest nation out of these. In my case, Oirat have also allied year and now that I broke their alliance with Udegi. This is just something you're gonna have to work around with. It's not hard to beat Oirat, it's just very annoying and time consuming because because they are so huge, along with their vassal Mongol. So if you can avoid it, do it, but if you can't, you're just gonna have to fight them, and that's something that you're gonna have to do. Now I'll be declaring on Solon right here, of course with a reconquest, and I will be co-belligerenting Nivik up here, which will bring in Ainu and Udegi, but it's not a problem, I'll just full annex Udegi as well. Don't forget to do a reconquest once you've formed Manchu. And a funny thing has happened in my case, Yuren just full annexed um, Solon, the nation I declared on, so I'm just left fighting Ainu. <laughs> if you can ally Oirat at any point, do it. I can ally them right now, and I will do it. They will help me out later versus Ming, maybe. And now I'm left with this after a couple of years in the game, and Yeren is the only nation left to fight that I don't have a truce with. Of course, you could have full annexed all of these guys and just be left with one nation, or you could have full annexed all of them and have the entirety of Manchuria. In my case, Yeren is allied to Oirat, and I am probably gonna have to fight them. First, 
I'm gonna try and make them not join somehow though. Of course once the renaissance spawns you are gonna have to dev it up. Luckily we are one of the hordes that does start off with feudalism, so at least we don't have to worry about that. But once we became Manchu our capital moved to Jilin and that is precisely where we're gonna be devving up the renaissance. It's a level 1 center of trade, it's grasslands too, sure we could have farmlands but it's way over here and we're not gonna be able to get there fast enough so Jilin is pretty much the next best province. Of course we are gonna activate the encouraged development state edict there and it shouldn't be that expensive. Focus on devving Diplo and Mill but if you have spare admin points to do it then sure go for it. Now let's discuss fighting Ming. Now you can fight Ming after they've passed their first reform or their second reform. The first reform will usually come around 10 to 20 years after you start the game. You won't be that powerful but you may have allied Oirat if they haven't made them into a tributary yet. And the second reform will usually come around the 1500s so 1480 to 1500 something like that. Now the benefit of fighting them after their first reform is well you fight them earlier and you beat them up earlier you make more money and you weaken them faster and usually when they pass their first reform you will have been able to ally Oirat. Now there's upsides to fighting them after they pass their second reform too. By that point you're a lot bigger you've conquered the entirety of Manchuria you may even own most of Korea and if Oirat are their tributary as well you will have fought Oirat as well and maybe own the entirety of Mongolia so you will be a lot bigger than that. At that point you can also cancel your tributary with them, and because you will have over 300 total dev, Ming will also get the unguarded nomadic frontier disaster, which will lower their mandate even further. So it is easier to fight them after they pass their second reform because you are bigger, but it is also pretty easy to fight them after they pass their first reform if you've allied Oirat. So here's what I recommend. If you can ally Oirat, you should fight them after they pass their first reform. If you can't ally Oirat, you should then grow yourself, conquer Korea, conquer all of these other Jurchen tribes up here, fight Oirat and Mongolia, take provinces from them, and then fight them after they pass their second reform. But the war is pretty much gonna pan out in a similar fashion, so that's why I'm gonna declare on them now, but you will be using everything I explain in this war after they've passed their first reform for your war if you're fighting them later after they've passed their second reform. So of course the first thing we want to do is cancel tributary. There we go, that does lower our stability but that's fine. We're also royal married to them so that will lower it even further, that's still fine. Of course we are gonna raise army maintenance and stuff like that and raise forts and we will want to build up a couple of more units too. There we go in my case my army is 13 13 right now of course that is a bit over a combat width but it's fine and now i'm just gonna wait for these troops to build and get ready to declare on ming you might catch them off guard with some of their forts being mothballed in my case this one right here they have mothballed it don't declare on them if they have high mandate sure you can beat them but it's so much easier when their mandate is below 50. Look at all the bad modifiers they get. Their armies are pretty much gonna be consisted of paper. And it's time for me to declare my war versus Ming. We are gonna declare using the take mandate of heaven CB, even though we aren't gonna be taking it right away. And if you're fighting them after they've passed their first reform and you've allied Orat, of course you should call them in. Orat is gonna get beat up pretty fast because Ming should go for them first. And there we go. The thing you're gonna want to focus on in this war is taking these forts right here. That's your primary objective. After that, you're gonna focus on fighting them so you can get as much war score as you can. Of course, if you fight them later after they've passed their second reform, you will have a much bigger army, in which case you will send a 10k regiment to siege down Beijing and with your main army, you're gonna focus on fighting them. Of course, particularly in step provinces. I am gonna hire a fort defense guy because, well, that's the only level one guy that's useful. Of course if you've declared the later war versus them you will have cannons by that point you should barrage forts and basically try and siege them down as fast as possible so you can go and fight them in battle. For your tier 2 government reform you should take martial society. And of course once you've beaten up Ming enough you will take as much as you can from them. Unfortunately Mongolia occupied Beijing in my case so I can't take it but you should of course take Beijing in your first war with Ming along with as much money as you can. So I'm just gonna get my cores back over here 
I'm also gonna take this province right here. And yeah, that's about as much as I can take without actually giving anything to Orat and Mongolia, which I don't wanna give it to them. And of course, we are not gonna be taking the Mandate of Heaven in our first war with Ming. And yeah, just take as much as you can. Unfortunately, this is as much as I can take due to Orat and Mongolia occupying a lot of provinces, but it is fine. Remember to take Beijing. And that's how your first war with Ming should have looked like, no matter if you're doing it now after their first reform or later after their second one. Now it's time for me to fight these guys up here. By this point in the game, you should of course spawn the renaissance in your capital. I have already embraced it, as we can see right here. For your first idea group as Manchu, I recommend taking quantity ideas. Remember, when thinking about our idea groups, we're thinking about Qing later on and what idea groups will mesh the best for them and not for us now as Manchu or Zhu. So I recommend opening up with quantity ideas. And of course we're gonna focus on Mill. And now that my truce with Korchen is up, I will be declaring on them and once again Ming will come in. Now this is the whole Bank of China meme where we're gonna milk Ming for every last penny. I'm basically gonna fight them again, lower my truce with them and take all of their money once again. All just for fighting Korchen. This will be easier later on if you've declared after they pass their second reform since then you will be able to border more of their tributaries. I only border two in my case, Korchen and Korea, but it's still fine, I'll be declaring on Korchen. And once again, we're gonna use the same strat versus Ming. Focus on Beijing, and after that, battle them. Of course, if you're planning on fighting them later, you will get some of these provinces here back after you get those events where Ming returns them to you. Of course, they could reject you, but it's pretty rare that they reject you. And now that I've beaten them up, I'm once again gonna take all of Ming's money. Nice. War reps too, sure. There we go. And I'm gonna be annexing Korchen. Nice. And pretty much after you've beaten up Ming once, you're gonna take every opportunity possible to beat them up again, whether it's directly or through attacking their tributaries, which they will defend, and you're gonna be taking their money, resetting your truce with them, once again taking their money, resetting your truce with them, you know how it goes. But if you fought them after they passed their first reform, your game should look a little something like this by now. Now I'm gonna go and fight Yeren. Maybe you've already cleaned up all of these guys over here. If you haven't fought Ming yet, that's fine. Focus on cleaning these guys in Manchuria, and then you can fight Korea, Mongolia, Oirat, and nations like that. You're pretty much gonna be following what I'm doing, except I just inserted my first Ming war right now instead of later. You may be doing the same. Now I'm gonna be declaring on the nation of Udegi, you're gonna be declaring on whoever is the weakest. Don't forget to use the Reconquest CB when fighting these guys up here. Of course, after you've already fought Ming once or twice and they have very low mandate, they will start blowing up and lots of other nations will start popping up over here. You may or may not have formed Qing by then. And there we go, now I'll be full annexing Udegi and Nivik as well. And of course, I'm gonna take all their money. Boom, and now it's just Yeren left the only nation that's allied with Oirat, and you might be in a similar situation, in fact you probably will, where one of these guys is allied to Oirat. Then fighting them is pretty much just unavoidable, unless you've allied them and have really high relations with them, and you can make them cancel their alliance with one of these guys by using 50 favors. But once you annex enough nations up here, you will be able to take the Dominate Rival Jurchen's missions where we get permaclaims and shock damage. And I can also unlock Shrines of the Mountain and unite the Jurchen tribes, where we get a very powerful general. It's a good idea to save this mission for right before you declare on Ming, so you can use this general right before fighting them. Specifically because that mission also gives us claims on some provinces owned by them. Once you have 8 banner regiments, you will be able to complete the mission The 8 Banners, which will give you claims on these regions right here. Mainly in Mongolia and in Korea. Now I'll be declaring on the nation of Yeren, fighting Urat as I said earlier. I will actually co-belligerent them and of course I will declare using the Reconquest CB. At this point, if you fought Ming like me, you might be doing something like this, or if you haven't fought Ming, you're still focusing on wiping out the Manchu nations, fighting Urat and Mongolia, and fighting Korea. And like I said earlier, when you get big enough and you're no longer Ming's tributary, they will get the Nomadic Frontier Disaster. You need to be a horde and have more than 300 dev. And as we can see, that disaster has started right now. Of course, that will only happen if you are not that tributary. That usually happens by the time they pass their second reform. At that same time, when they pass their second reform, you will break your tributary status with them. They'll also get this disaster and it's very easy to fight them at that point. Even easier after they pass their first reform like I'm doing it right now. But like I said, you can do it either way. And of course I will be full annexing urine and finally getting all my cores back. 
and there we go, that's done. By around this time, if you haven't fought Ming, you will have parts of Korea and Mongolia. But because I did fight Ming, that's why I don't have those provinces. And because my truce with Ming is up, I will be declaring my second direct war with them. Of course, you can get around the truce by declaring on their tributaries. I don't have any tributaries to declare on, so I'll just be declaring on them right now. Once again, using the Take Mandate of Heaven CB. And when the unguarded nomadic frontier disaster takes from Ming, you will get these events that pop up periodically to let you know about the disaster's progress. Of course, if you declare on them, it will start ticking faster. You could do that, or you could just wait until it fires and then declare on them. The choice is yours. For your tier 3 government reform, you should take religious society. For your first stage ability, you should take justified wars or cavalry armies. For your second idea group, I recommend taking administrative ideas. This is once again accounting for forming Qing later, and is gonna help out massively with our national ideas by meshing well with them, and gov cap, tech cost, mercenary stuff, it's all great. And now that I'm done fighting Beijing, I'll be taking these provinces from them, all their money and war reps. Ideally, you would take something like this in your first war with them. Of course, if they haven't given you your cores back, you would take back your cores and maybe one or two more provinces over here, like Beijing and Yongping. But since I have some of those, this is what I'm taking in my second war. You will want to take as much as possible from them. Remember to not take the Mandate of Heaven yet. We don't want it yet. Because if we become Qing now, we'll be too weak to maintain the mandate. We need to become more powerful and then claim it. Or if you want, you can just not take it at all. And I will be explaining that shortly. Once you do take Beijing, you will be able to take the mission bypass the Great Wall. And once you own some provinces in these areas right here, you will also be able to unlock this mission. And by around the 1490s, your game should look a little something like this. So we started off as Zhang Zhu, quickly conquered all the provinces we needed to form Manchu and gain cores on the rest of the Manchuria region. We were the most powerful horde in this region, and now we're the most powerful horde, well, probably in the entire world, and we're ready to form Qing. Now, your game should look a little something like this but it also may not depending on when you chose to fight Ming after they passed their first or second reforms because I fought them after they passed their first reform I was focusing on them mostly while leaving out Korea and Oirat plus Mongolia for later so if you went the route that I did your game will look a little something like this if you chose to fight them after they passed their second reform you will have all of Korea by now and you will have a very big portion of Oirat and Mongolia maybe you'll be up to somewhere around here, full annexing all of Mongolia and taking a big chunk out of Oirat, and you'll basically own Manchuria, most of Mongolia and Korea, without fighting Ming yet. Either way, that's the only difference, when you fought Ming, now or later. But this is around the time where you will be fighting them if you chose to fight them with the second option. At this point, we have a very powerful army. Mine is consisted of 13k infantry and 13k cavalry. Most of that cavalry is banners, and of course, I could recruit a couple of more banners, which I will be doing. My combat width right now is 22, so what? Uh, 13, 13 seems about right. Of course, I could double up since my force limit is 62, but that might be too costly, and an army this size is big enough for me for now. Of course, I will be expanding it pretty soon too. By this point, we should be making a nice income. I'm making around 7.38 ducats a month. I have four forts and a full army stack, and we will be making even more money as we pick off Korea and Oirat and the rest of Ming. And later, of course, we will be forming Qing, one of my favorite nations in the game, a very powerful nation. Now, in the decision here, as we can see, we need to own the province of Ningyuan, which is right here. It is one of our cores. We need to own the province of Shilangol, which is right here in Mongolia. You may or may not have it by this point, depending on when you chose to fight Ming. We also need to own the province of Shenyang, which is right here, another one of our cores. And we also need to own the province of Beijing. I have it, but you may not, but those are the four provinces we need to own. We also need to be at peace, be independent, and be the emperor of China, which means we need to take the mandate of heaven. But you don't need to do that. I know that lots of players, probably the majority, dislike the mandate of heaven because of the way it forces forces you to play a certain playstyle in China. I have to say that, even though I'm probably in the minority, I love the Mandate of Heaven. I do think it brings a nice dynamic to playing in this part of the world, and it forces you to play a different way other than what you're used to playing as. So, I like the Mandate of Heaven, no matter how unpopular that may be. So, of course, if you want to play with the Mandate of Heaven, you will simply choose to take 
the mandate of heaven when piecing out Ming. And you should do that when you have about most of Ming. So when you get to around here, that's when you should take it. That will take probably around four or five wars versus Ming. Of course, if they started blowing up, like in my case, it will take less. But once you own half of Ming, I feel like that's when you're ready to take the mandate. However, you can still form Ming without actually being the emperor of China. All you need to do is dismantle the Chinese emperor. And to do that, you need to full annex whoever is the current emperor. In my case, it's still Ming. Sometimes Shun becomes the emperor if they get big enough and if they blow up, or it might be any of those guys that pop up in the south, such as Yu, Wu, Dali, any of these guys pretty much. And that's what you need to do to destroy it. Just full annex whoever has it, and then that requirement will change from being the emperor of China to being an actual empire government rank. And after you form Qing, of course, you will continue to take over all of China. You will gain claims on all of China, later cores on all of China through your missions, which is awesome, very awesome. And you will continue to expand mainly in the Manchuria, Korea, South China, Xina, North China, Mongolia and Tibet regions, tributary nations around you. Maybe you want to blob out even more. Of course, you can do that. Just make sure to max out your mandate before that. And the world is your oyster as Zhangzhou, Manchu, and later Qing. Depending on if you want the Emperor of China or not, it doesn't matter. Later you'll also be fighting Japan, continuing to expand in all the regions you've been expanding, and it's a pretty standard horde game until you form Qing, but after that it can still be a pretty blobby game even after you form Qing. They have awesome national ideas, awesome missions, and you will have lots of fun. Like I said, Qing is one of my favorite nations in the game. After this point, of course, you will continue to build buildings, however irrelevant they may be for horde they will be very relevant as Qing. Don't destroy a lot of forts, you do need forts to maintain prosperity, to gain even more mandate. I only destroyed one right here, but you can actually build forts once you become Qing to help you up with the mandate. You're gonna be building workshops in high value trade good provinces. There's not a lot of them up here in Manchuria, but there's definitely a lot of them in China, especially in South and East China, lots of them in Japan later on. In India, if you plan to expand that way, you will be building marketplaces on all the center of trade provinces. Make sure to build barracks and training fields as well, manufactories, furnaces later on, soldiers' households for all that sweet, sweet manpower, even though we did go with quantity ideas. Speaking of quantity, of course, that was our first idea group. As our second idea group, we took admin ideas. After that, I recommend offensive or quality for your third idea group, and for your fourth idea group, you should take Diplo. After that, it's pretty much your choice as Ching, depending on what you want to do. Now, if you're still Manchu by this point, for tier four, I recommend taking centralized power and for tier 5 I recommend taking barbaric despoilers. Of course when you form Qing you will have different government reforms. You will start off with the tier 1 celestial empire reform but that's a whole nother video. You can rack up a couple of achievements starting as John Zhu and forming Manchu and Qing. A Manchurian candidate where you need to start as one of the Jurchen tribes and form Qing. Qing of China where you need to become the Chinese emperor as Qing. You will also do that. These banners need a saga where you need to have 100 banner regiments. That that is definitely possible with the age ability later in the age of absolutism and turning the tide starting as a step horde in 1444 embrace all institutions and like i said by around the 1490s your game should look a little something like this if you're not that confident in your abilities or if you're not sure if your game is gonna go like mine this save file is available for all youtube members in the save games discord channel and you can continue playing as manchu from this date forward let me know in the comments below what's the next nation that i should do a guide on and if you want to watch me do stuff like this live you can follow me on twitch.tv slash the Red Hawk live and you can catch up on everything I do over there on the VOD channel link is in the description if you enjoyed this video don't hesitate to leave a like it really helps out the channel a lot and if you really like it you can always subscribe let's try and hit 40k subs huh and you can become a member today and join the discord the link is in the description thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time with another EU4 video